Well, good morning, church. We are so glad that you are joining us today for week two of our series called Everyone Everywhere. Uh, this series is taking us through the month of April. We're going to put a big exclamation point at the end of the month on April the 28th when we have Serve Day. So be sure you note that. Um, we've been having conversations about what it looks like to love and serve everyone everywhere. And we're focusing our attention on a verse from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, which says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, I love this verse because it highlights a strategy for us on how to love and serve those uh, that are around us, but those to the ends of the earth. Um, last week, we, had, uh, we got to hear Adam and Amy. Amy's our community engagement pastor. They had a conversation about what it looks like to focus on loving our neighbors right here where we are, loving the people that are around us. And as a church, we make it a priority to love others. Um, and we want to do that. We want to do a good job of that. Um, Amy spoke about the hands-on work that's happening here. Um, and she spoke with passion about how we as a church support our local mission partners. And today I'm excited because we're going to spend some time talking about those that we serve internationally. We're going to talk about our global mission partners. And so with me today is John Shaw. John is our group's pastor. Yeah, show him some love. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to talk about how we go to the ends of the earth through global missions. Um, so yeah, John, you're our group's pastor, and you are, just I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's, uh, you're married to Lindy, and together you're parenting three wonderful kids. They're super cute, they're too. They're so cute. They're the yeah, cutest. They're I really love them. cute. Yeah. Uh, John, you came to us from Colorado three years ago, mm -hmm. and um, I really feel like under your leadership, um, you've really uh, strengthened our group model here. In fact, we currently have a little over 65% of our church is involved in a community group, which is great. Yeah, that's something to clap about. Um, but before we start talking about global missions today, John, um, tell me a little bit about why you love serving here as our group's pastor. I love groups for so many reasons. Like I could spend a whole sermon on that alone, and I have before, and I probably will again. Um, but just just for some background, like there's two main reasons why I love community groups for for everybody. And the first one is the care and community. Like you look at the size of our church across three services and 1,200, 1,400, however many we have. There's no way for us to effectively care for all the people in our church. And, and that's where community groups come in, and this is where uh, people get the care. I, I can't tell you how many times I have heard somebody say, oh yeah, I was in the hospital a couple weeks ago. Um, and I'm like, what, I never heard, I didn't know. It's like, oh yeah, my group took care of me, like we didn't need you. I'm like, I love that so much. We, we actually invest uh, time and, and money in, lead, in, in developing our leaders. Just a couple weeks ago, we had a leaders training where we taught them specifically how to care for those in their group well. I mean, this is just the best place. And then there's the community part. This is like a great place to make friends. Like um, when you go to a new church in a new community, if you want to make friends in that new community, you got to join a community group. It is by far the best way. But number two is discipleship. Like this is the best way for people to grow in their faith here. So what I say is this. When you come to a service like this, you're going to walk away with, man, I need to do this, this, and this, and this. And then you leave and you do nothing right? But if you go to a community group, like, man, Adam challenged me in this way, and I need to do this this next week. Man, now you have accountability. Somebody's going to come and talk to you. Hey, next week, how, hey, how did you do with that? Did you, did you change? And I have seen so much growth and people develop in their, their walk with Christ through community groups because of that relationships. Um, and, and besides that, with this missions theme, like, I really view our leaders as missionaries. Like, my wife opened my eyes up to that uh, a couple months ago. Um, she's like, man, I, I was thinking, I was so glad when we got married, I thought you were going to make me go to Africa or something, we're going to live on the mission field, and I'm so glad you didn't do that, and then I, I realized that we are missionaries, like we are missionaries here, um, because uh, for me and my wife, every year, almost every year, we go and start a new community group. And that's kind of hard for some people because these are my people. You're really close to these people. And to leave them is kind of like, like tearing something apart of you. But, it, but you're creating community for more people who need it. And if we're not developing leaders and we're not having these missionaries go and start new groups, man, uh, the, the church will never grow. And so I, I do view your community group leader as a missionary. They have left a group or they've started a new group out of something that they loved and, and they, they miss. 
to create space for you. And I truly expect is as you grow and develop in your community group, that's most of you will probably do the same thing. And I love that about the church. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, um, in addition to leading groups, John, you're also over our global missions efforts, which mm -hmm. I think has really grown and benefited from your leadership. Um, John spends time uh, communicating with our missionaries that we support. You're planning mission trips, and you're also managing the budget for our global mission efforts. Um, but uh, missionaries and mission work, it's not new to you. No. You grew up in this in this area, right? So tell everybody a little bit about that. Yeah, so my dad was a, preacher's, a preacher, so I was a PK. Um, but when I was born, he was actually a professor at Platte Valley Bible College. And every summer, he would take uh, short-term trips to Mexico, around the world. So I was born in June, and in July, I went on my first mission trip. Yeah, um, there's like a record, right? That, that, might, be, that might be the youngest, maybe. I don't know. Um, there's others who have been born there. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, from birth until 18, I went on a mission trip every single summer of my life, except for one. Um, and then I've been on many others. I think I've, I've hit a total of 30 countries. If you include airports, I've been to probably 33 or something. Um, but I, I love missions. Um, in fact, as you can see here, for two and a half years, I lived in China. Uh, I graduated college. I didn't know what to do with my life, so I'm like, I'll go to China, you know? Um, and, and what I really discovered there is, is a passion for missions even more because I had grown up in the church. My dad was a pastor. I went to a Bible college, and so my entire life I'd kind of been in this Bible bubble. And so to go to China where I was literally the only foreign Christian in the town. I didn't know any other Christians uh, like me. I was the only one. And so I had to be all in or nothing. Um, that was transformational for me. Um, but just to see the actual church persecution that happens there, you may not know this, but in China it is essentially illegal to be a Christian. Um, they have government churches that you can go to um, where there are certain books of the Bible you cannot read from. There are certain songs you cannot sing. It is highly regulated. Um, but the house churches where they try to do what they can freely, Man, those are cracked down. And even since I was there, uh, the church has been even more persecuted. So there are church buildings that I have been in that have been torn down in China since I was there. Uh, things have gotten so, so bad there. Um, but that's, that's my goal. I love missions, and that's kind of my retirement plan. I'm going to work here until you fire me, and then I'm going to go and spend my, my twilight years uh, serving God in some country somewhere. That's, that's kind of my goal. Yeah, so missions work is very uh, personal to your story, is part of your background. Tell me, as, as you've led global missions here at Northridge, um, tell everybody why we as a church believe so strongly in the work of missions on a global scale. Yeah, uh, it's very clear, Acts 1-8, what we were talking about earlier, go into the entire world, like we talked about that, like that's very clear. <laughs> but there's another verse in Romans, uh, Romans 10, that is just, just a big one that I love. And then Paul says this, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Man, I, I love this verse so much. Paul kind of starts from the end goal and works his way backwards. <clears throat> Because um, we all want everyone to have what we've experienced, right? If you are a believer in this room, like, man, Christ has changed you. He's transformed you. He's, he's done all these great things. And you, so you want that for everybody else, right? But how are they going to get there unless somebody tells them? And how is somebody going to tell them unless somebody sends them? And, man, how beautiful are the feet of those who go. And so I, I think that is our driving force as a church. That, and for us, many of us, like, we're not actually the ones going, and I love this verse because it talks about the equippers. What Jonathan was talking about earlier, for us in America, if you make minimum wage, you are in the top 9% of wage earners in the world. Like, and so at the very least, you have been equipped financially to help send people to go share the gospel with others. And, and I love that. And, and man, I hope some of you, my goal, my, my dream, my passion is that for some of you in this room, two, three, four of you, feel God's call on your heart. And, man, he is calling me to go to Africa. He's calling me to go to Asia. He's man, if two, three, four of you get that call, then I will be ecstatic. I feel like God will put that on you. But, but all of you, I think, we'll talk about this in a little bit. I think all of you ought to go on a small, a short-term mission trip. I think that is so transformational um, because blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. 
Yeah, one of the things you may or may not know about our church is that all of the tithes and offerings that we receive every week, every month, we take 10% off the top of that and we designate it for local and global missions. Um, and oftentimes it's even more than that when you think of other, other, other things that we're trying to accomplish. So if you're a person that is investing financially in the mission of Northridge, you're supporting missionaries. You're supporting missionaries across the world, but you're also supporting missions happening right here in Milledgeville. Um, last week, uh, Amy shared that we, we spent about $140,000 uh, just on local missions. How did we do on global missions last year? Yeah, so budgeted. Well, we have budgeted to go out um, every month. Um, last year, we sent out $97,800. Now, when you add in one-time gifts, so we did one-time gift to Israel, uh, to Syria, these, these different, whenever there's a disaster, we have money set aside that we can send out there. Um, when you include our short-term mission trips and stuff like that, we, we have given well over $150,000 to Global yeah. Missions. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So, um, John, you mentioned mission trips, and I'm so glad that we're able to take mission trips again. There was a period of time where we, we really mm -hmm. couldn't do that. But um, two weeks ago on Easter, you and I were preparing for a five-day trip to Juarez, Mexico. Uh, we went with a team of 19 people from our church, and uh, we built a house in three days. Um, and it was, it was a really remarkable experience. We, we were with an organization called Casas Por Cristo. And um, I know it was a life-changing experience for me and all of those people that were on the trip. So talk a little bit about that. Why yeah, are mission trips important? I love short-term mission trips for so many reasons. Um, and this trip was fun. Like, if you just look at the team, it was so much fun. What I love most, uh, I love every aspect of mission trips. One of the things I love most about mission trips is, is you have a group of strangers who come together and by the time you leave, you're like immediately best friends. Like, it's just so incredible. And so we're gonna show you about 20 pictures of our trip, and you're gonna see how we went from a bare piece of ground on day one to a full house on day three. And, and it'll be really cool for you to look at. Um, but, but this is such an amazing trip for so many reasons, but it, I, I feel like more than us blessing that family, I feel like we were, were the ones who were blessed. Like we walked away changed and transformed. And this was your first trip. So yeah. I want to hear your perspective on the trip. Yeah, this was my first mission trip. And it was um, my first time out of the country. So um, it, was, it was such a transformative experience for me. Um, I felt like it took me out of my comfort zone, but in a really, really positive way. Um, I would say that outside of being a Christ follower, a wife, and a mom, this was one of the most uh, impactful experiences that I've had. Um, to be able to go to Juarez, build this house in three days with this team, um, I feel like it really demonstrated the goodness of God uh, to our team, but also to the family that was receiving this house at the end of the week. Um, one of the highlights of going on the trip was being a part of this team of, of 19 unique individuals um, where we all came around one mission together. Um, the, I thought it was so cool that the, the youngest person on the trip was 10, and the oldest person was somewhere close to 70. And uh, we all had different backgrounds and different experiences, uh, varying degrees of um, construction knowledge, which shocking to you, I'm sure. I don't have a ton of construction knowledge, but I did my best and learned as much as I could. Um, but you did I great, love. By the way. You thank did great. you, thank you. Um, stuccoing is my jam. Right I'm there. Sorry. Yeah, I'm stuck. Well, right this there. is the chicken wire, which was a pain. Oh yeah, we don't like chicken wire. Yes, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, but it, you know, just having that experience and seeing the team approach some uncomfortable situations, some some difficult tasks with such enthusiasm and passion. Um, I, I'll always remember that. Um, and I just will always remember seeing God at work through the very early planning stages of this trip all the way through when we dedicated the house and handed over the keys. Um, I could just see his hand um, through all of that. And I will say too, the, the icing on the cake for me personally was getting to share this experience with my 17-year-old son, Joe. Um, along with some of his close friends that, that went on the trip too. Um, I know my faith was shaped by the experience, um, but I believe that if you're a young person, um, getting to have this experience of being in Juarez and seeing this house built, um, I think it's something that they're always going to remember. And it's something that I'm praying really um, anchors 
anchors them to the kingdom of God um, in a way that you might not experience here. Um, because I think, you know, we live in this bubble of, of Milledgeville, this small bubble, but being able to see how God works on a global scale is really powerful, whether you're a young person or if you're older, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, that's one of my, my favorite parts of a mission trip is, is seeing people who have never been before experience the world as it really is, um, because we really are in a bubble. Um, see the poverty that most people live in and the joy that they still have in the midst of it. I think that's something a lot of our younger ones that went, uh, they were amazed by. It's like these, these kids have nothing yet. They're still happy. And we had fun without our things. And maybe all these things that we have or feel like we need in America, maybe it's not that necessary. And I, I just love that so much. For, for me, it's also just eye-opening to see how God is at work around the world. I just love that so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, a lot of times I think when people are thinking about taking um, a mission trip, um, they usually have some reservations about, about it. Um, they may feel uncertain about stepping outside of their comfort zone um, and committing to going on a trip. When you're talking to people, John, what are some of the common obstacles you hear people express about taking a trip like this? Yeah, there's three main things that people bring up every single time. Mm-hmm. Number one is money. I can't afford to go on this trip. So let me take that one off the, off the table immediately. We don't even allow you to pay for your own trip. We don't want you to pay for your trip. One of the important aspects of the mission trip is fundraising. Um, and it's one of the hardest, like if we're honest, like I hate it. But let me tell you why it's important. Number one, even for those who can just write a check and, and, and pay for it, where's the trust in God in that? And so we want people to trust God in this, and you're allowing him to come in. And there's so many stories as we're building the team of, man, this person gave, and I haven't talked to them in years, and this person gave, and I, they weren't even believers. And they, the stories of how God brings in the support, and it's all him, is such an important part of the trip building part. Um, besides that, it's important for several different reasons. Um, it, it's important because... It helps you see how missionaries live. So, so missionaries have to come and fundraise every year or two. And for you to experience the anxiety that it feels to ask people for money is so important that hopefully after that you will be more willing to be generous to missionaries after that because it is so hard. And more than that, there are people who would love to go on a mission trip like you're going on and simply can't. And this gives them an opportunity to partner with you and be a part of the trip through you by financially supporting you. And even more than that, when somebody is financially invested in a trip like this, they're willing to pray for you. And man, that's what we need the most. And so if somebody's financially invested, they're going to pray for you, and that's going to make for a much better trip. Yeah. Number, number two is always safety. And so this last trip to Juarez, people are like, Juarez? You can't go to Juarez. Yeah, what are you thinking? <laughs> I, got e- I got so many emails and people coming to talk to me. You can't go. To- Have you heard about? Yes, I've heard about Juarez. So let me ask you from your perspective, how safe did you feel? Yeah, I never felt unsafe in Juarez, honestly. Um, we were fortunate to have... Uh, a very large group, and we used common sense, and we stuck together, Um, so that was really important. It's true that there you're going to come face-to-face with some really extreme poverty, right? Like, um, and and that's that's pretty shocking when you first see it, Um, but I can say that I never felt anything other than kindness and warmth from the people that we were around. Um, The organization that we were partnering with, Casas Por Cristo, Um, It was kind of obvious to me that they have a good reputation in the community that we were serving. Like when we were driving around in the Casas vans, you know, it says uh, Casas Por Cristo on the side of the vans. Uh, We were met with with people waving and smiling and, um, you know, lots of smiling. So it kind of made me feel like um, they know that we're there to do good work. And there's a certain level of respect uh, because of the work that we were doing there. Um, so I never, I never felt unsafe uh, yeah. while we were there in Morris. And as the leader of missions, we'll never send you on a trip that feels unsafe. Mm-hmm. Casas Por Cristo has been in that community for 25 years. They, they've never had an issue with the cartels, even back in 2012 and 13 when things were the worst. 
Um, they were still able to build houses, didn't have any issues. When we go on a mission trip and we go with a, an established partner in that community who is well known in that community and has a, a record of safety in that community, um, we will do. And I can't guarantee your safety. Like, honestly, you go on a trip, I can't guarantee your safety. But I can't guarantee my safety right now. This light might fall on me right now and I could die. Uh, safety is not guaranteed for anybody. Um, but we're not going to send you somewhere where we, we feel is unsafe for you. <clears throat> but the third thing that, that I often hear um, for people is, is uh, I'm too old or I'm too young. And you talked about this earlier. Like, we, we had both extremes on this trip. We, we had a 10-year-old who went, and, man, he did so great. I, I loved watching him. He tried just about everything, and that was fun. We had um, some almost 70. Our, on our last trip that we took, we partnered with some other churches, and I swear almost all of them were over the age of 70. And they were still, one, one couple had done like 50 houses. They had done 50 builds. They, they just come and they just pour out themselves in it. They, they love it. Um, I, I, my favorite part of our trip was watching these girls, many of whom had no tools. They bought tools specifically to go on this trip. And they're coming and they're trying everything and they're doing it and they're just being taught how to do it. And they just learned and they just did it. And it was so awesome. And, and so God is, is, is available. The, the only skill that you need sometimes on these trips is the ability to smile and say Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. Like some of our trips, it's, it's, we go to um, Nepal, and we had guys go, it was a medical trip, and the two of our guys, three of our guys that went, had no medical experience. They're just cleaning medical equipment, they're talking and playing with kids, um, they're, just, they're just showing the love of Christ any way they can. So if you have a willing heart, a smile, and you just tell people they love them, you have enough skills. Yeah, something I really learned through this trip was you know, you, every, every time you tr go out on a step of faith, whenever you try something that's outside of your comfort zone that takes you out of that, um, you're going to have a certain amount of insecurity or, or uncertainty. But I really experience God just, he fills in the gaps, right? Like if you're worried about money, he's going to fill in that gap. If you're worried about um, your skill set or your safety, he comes right beside you and fills in that gap. Um, so I would encourage you to think about that. If you're, if you're uncertain about if that's something you could do, remember that, that he comes right there beside you and fills in that gap. Mm. Um, we're going to uh, look at a map now. I'll draw your attention to that. It, it gives you a visual of where our mission partners are working throughout the world. Um, we're actually very strategic in how we come alongside our international mission partners. Um, we even have a team that comes and evaluates the work that's being done. Um, they want to ensure that the, the group that we're partnering with is, is really making disciples and they're making an impact in the kingdom of God. Um, so, John, you lead up this team, and mm -hmm. I'd ask you to just talk a little bit about how we determine the support for our global mission partners. Yeah, so there's five major areas that we kind of look at when we're evaluating who's going to become a mission partner, how much support they get. Um, and the first one is their relationship with Northridge. We want somebody who's connected to Northridge in some way, and they have that relationship. And so if you are someone who feels God's, God's tugging on your heart, and he's calling you to go be a missionary, man, we will support you. Like, like we're all in. We're going to help you. Um, number two is the length of time on the field and the commitment to the field. And so when somebody goes overseas and they want to serve, it is of no use to go for a couple years and then leave. It's not helpful. You don't have enough time to learn the language well enough. You don't have enough time to make the, the connections in the community well enough. And you don't have the time to, to really develop anything that's ongoing and lasting. And so somebody who's been there for a while and has plans to be there for a while, those are the people that we want to support because we know that's how ministry will grow and be effective with that. Um, number three is ministry focus. We're, we're, we're focusing on three major areas, and we'll talk about these a little bit more later, but we're, we're, we want to focus on people who are developing leadership, local leadership, that they're not doing it themselves. We're looking for people who are planting churches, and we're looking at people who are focused on um, humanitarian. They, they're really trying to do show the hands and feet of Jesus in those areas. And a lot of times it's, it's all three of those combined, um, but they need to be doing at least one of those. Uh, number four is location. And so you may not know this, but there are about 2,000 to 3,000 people groups that have no Bible in their language, and many of them who have never heard of Jesus at all. 
And so if you are going to these unreached people groups, that's what we call them, unreached people groups, if you're going to one of them, man, we are going to support you more because that's, we need to get the word ends of the earth to the ends of the earth to them. So if you're going there, that, that we're going to help them. And, and we get this, I, I love how Paul puts it in Romans 15. Um, he says uh, in verse 20, 21, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. I just love that. We will support those going to the unknown places more. Um, and number five is ability, your leadership ability. You've got to be able to do the things that you say that you want to do, and we'll, we'll evaluate your leadership ability. Yeah. So if you've been out into our lobby right across from the cafe, you'll see our mission walls. And that on one side, we have our local mission partners. On the other, we have our global mission partners. And currently, we have about 10 international partners that we're supporting. And um, maybe right now we can spend a little time talking about a few of them and share the type of work that they're doing where they are. Yeah, I would love to talk about each of them individually. Um, we just don't have time for that. Um, throughout the year, occasionally during an offering uh, meditation, you'll hear a little bit more about each one of them. Um, but just to save time, we've kind of grouped them into those three categories that I talked about earlier. So you can kind of see the ones that are doing the different things. Um, the first area is leadership development. We believe this is so vitally important because there's, there's one thing for you to come here, oh, there's an American coming to, to my country and they want to tell me about Jesus, as opposed to, hey, there's somebody who looks like me and speaks like me and knows my culture, who is from my culture, who is telling me about Jesus. And that is far more effective. And so we want to be developing pastors, developing leaders in these communities who will take it to their own people because that is the most effective way of reaching a community. Um, and so you see these partners right here, they are committed to developing leaders um, and not doing the work themselves. Um, the second one is church planting. We, we believe that the church is God's representation of the kingdom here on earth. And even though it's, it's not always perfect, this is the best way. And so these partners are, are focused on planting churches and, and making churches that are focused on planting churches. It's multiplication. So they plant this church, it grows, it goes and plants another church, it grows and it goes and plants another church, and it just spreads and spreads. That's the, the goal of these mission partners. And you'll see uh, pioneer Bible translators on there. This one was a hard one to kind of shoe into one of these places because their goal is to translate the Bible into all these languages that don't have the Bible yet. Um, but if you think about it, it's hard to plant a church if you don't have the, lang the, the Bible in their language. And so they are a pivotal part of that church planting process. Um, the final way is humanitarian. And we truly believe that, that people um, need to feel God's love before they're willing to listen about his love. And so we want to make sure people's bellies are filled, that their, their uh, medical needs have been taken care of, and that they feel God's love physically built a house um, so that they can experience what people are saying and, and know that what is being said is actually true. And so these mission partners are all over the world. They're doing some really good work. Fame is medical missions. Um, CORE is doing food in Haiti, which really needs it right now. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that that's that way. And, and there's a verse that why this is so important, and it comes from Matthew 25. Jesus is, is talking um, to his people, and he separates the sheep from the goats. Um, and he says to the, sh the sheep, he says, um, you took care of me. Um, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was homeless, you gave me a place to stay. And those who belong to him say, when? When did we do this? When did we give you something to eat? When did we give you something to drink? When did we visit you? And he says this in Matthew uh, 25, 40. He says, whatever you did for the least one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And, that, and that's what we want to do. And that's what you get to do when you participate in giving to Northridge, to missions. You get to be one of those who helps one of the least of these. And I, I love that so much. Everyone gets to do something no matter what. That's right. So um, we actually have a couple of our global mission partners that we can't speak about publicly uh, because to do so would put them in jeopardy. It would, um, it would it jeopardize their safety and for fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. um, you know a lot about the church and the state, the state of the church internationally. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, how are things um, internationally from a persecution standpoint? You may not know it in America, but things internationally are not great. Um, the, the last decade, um, they say, has been some of the worst Christian persecution ever since Christianity has been around. Um, we have two mission partners that if we were to show them or live stream them, they would literally be put at risk. They could not go back to their country. Uh, they would be expelled. 
Um, and so we can't. You can see them on the back wall. You can read about them if you want. Um, but literally, their lives would be put in danger if we talked about them. And, and that's true about the church. Open Doors is an organization that kind of tracks persecution, persecution around the world. Um, and I follow them regularly. And, and this is kind of their map of worst places to live um, last year. Um, and you start with, like, North Korea is really bad. Like, you literally, if you are found with a Bible, you immediately get sent to a prison camp. Uh, most of them don't make it out of there. Um, Open Door said that last year, nearly 5,000 Christians were killed for their faith worldwide. Um, that's almost 13 a day. Um, at least 14,766 churches and Christian properties were attacked during that time. Uh, they, they report a sevenfold increase on uh, churches and church run properties. Uh, they also warn that more than 365 million, that's one in seven Christians in the world, uh, face high levels of persecution for their faith. Like for us here in America, like that's hard to imagine. We don't experience, we don't see it. The, the news media doesn't talk about it, but it's real and it's tragic and it's terrible. Um, but what Jesus tells us uh, in Luke 21, he tells us um, this. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison. And you'll be brought before kings and governors, all on my account. And you will bear testimony to me. And Paul, later on, Paul says in 2 Timothy that if anyone wants to live a godly life in Christ, you will be persecuted. We will. That's what it says. Uh, but, but what I want you to know, and part of the purpose of this, is I want you to realize that 15% of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the world are currently facing extreme persecution. And, and man, my prayer is that you pray for them daily. I do. I've got a calendar in my office, and I, I regularly pray for them. But, but be aware that, that life for us is easy. Like, man, it is so easy for us. But when talking to these mission partners, they, they both, both of these mission partners bring up the same verse in Ephesians 6, and I, I love it so much. This is their prayer for themselves. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. And I love that prayer so much. They're not praying for safety. They're not praying for comfort. They're not praying for security. They're praying in, in spite of this fear. They're not in prison. But in spite of this fear, danger of prison or death, that I will speak fearlessly. And that is such a powerful prayer. Yeah, it is. So outside of prayer and outside of investing financially into the mission of Northridge, how can, how can our church get involved in global missions here at Northridge? Yeah, super easy. Um, you can scan the QR code in front of you, go to the hub on our website, you go to our website, northridge.online, and you click the hub. There's a form there for missions interest. You fill that out if you want updates on things that are going on missionally at Northridge, you can get those. Um, and that is just the easiest way. Um, number two, I want to encourage you to commit to praying for our mission partners. Uh, go out every week that you come in these doors, go to the mission wall, pick a different one, and pray for them. Um, I want to encourage you to write them cards. You, you may not know this, but there's a box on our global missions wall out there, and you can write a card of encouragement to our mission partners, and we send those away uh, to them directly, and they love hearing how much the church uh, cares for them and, and wants them to do that. In fact, we set out some extra tables and extra cards. I want to encourage you. We've got like 30 cards left out there available. I want to encourage you to go finish writing a note to our mission partners after this service out there. Um, number three, missionary convention. So every November, early November, there's a missionary convention. It bops around to different places around the world. And I love going to that and meeting um, about 5,000 people show up. And you get to meet hundreds of different missionaries in different places and hear what they're doing. In 2025, they're coming to Atlanta. And I would love to take a huge group of us to just go see that. It's an incredible experience. And you get to learn so much about how the world is happening around us, what God is doing around the world around us. Um, number four, like become a missionary. Like, I know there are some of you in this room, God has just putting it on your heart right now. You can feel your heart beating faster and faster. God is calling you, man, maybe you need to go to this place in the world. And I want to encourage you, don't, don't ignore God's call on your life as he's calling you to do that. We, if you go, we will support you. We, we promise we will. Um, but number five, take a short-term mission trip. Like, this is a great way for you to grow in your spiritual walk. I think we've got a slide with our upcoming trips. Um, we've got Guatemala. We're doing a, another Casas build in Guatemala on July 15th through 21st. Um, this one will fill up fast. Everybody who went on our last Casas trip, they all want to go on this next one. Like, you got to hold off. you got to let some new people sign up. Um, but this is going to be a, a great trip. 
Um, and so if you go onto the hub, scan that QR code in front of you, text that number, um, it'll pull up that missions form. Everything is on that one missions form. There is a link that you can sign up directly for this trip now. The signups have opened for this trip. It will fill up fast. So if you want to go on this trip, you got to fill up fast, uh, sign up fast. Um, in October, we'll go back to Juarez, um, October 3rd through 8th. This overlaps with both Baldwin County and uh, JMA's, or GMC, no, JMA's uh, fall breaks. Um, and so you only have to miss two days of school. Um, go in that one, also a Casas build. In early November, we don't quite have the dates yet, we'll go visit the Weldons in Nepal. Um, and this trip will look different depending on who goes. So if we get a bunch of people with medical experience, it will be a medical trip. If we get a bunch of Joe Schmoes like me, um, maybe we'll just go paint an orphanage or go love on kids and have a VBS or something like that. Um, in Ethiopia, late March, early April 2025, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to this trip. So we're going to Addis Ababa, and we're going to just go love on the kids. There's a, a group of kids that live in the slums on the edge of town. Like, literally not even slums, they live in the trash heap. How they get food is they scavenge through this trash heap every day. And we're going to go, we're just going to love on them. We're going to have a sports camp, we're going to have a VBS, we're going to feed them, and we're just going to show them that, that Jesus loves you, we love you. And we're going to be there for the missionaries there, the weeks, um, and that's going to be great. So if you want any more information on any of these trips, you can fill out that form on the hub. And once we get more dates, once we get more information, we'll send that out to you directly, but you gotta sign up for that online. That's right. So here at Northridge, we're all about helping you take your next step closer to Jesus. And um, I wanna invite you to be a participant in global missions, no matter what that looks like. John's laid out some clear steps. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but we really believe that everyone has a next step. Um, John, will you pray for yeah. us? Uh, pray for our church as we uh, explore global missions and maybe pray for someone in this room who might be thinking about what their next step is. Yeah. God, we come before you now, and we are just so grateful for how you use us, um, b both here in Millersville, but God, around the world. Um, right now, I just want to pray for the mission partners that we support, and God, all the missionaries around the world that we don't, but are doing amazing work in your name. God, we pray that you give them all that they need to accomplish all that you have for them. And God, for those of us in this room, uh, I, I pray that you open their eyes to eat, that each one of them can do something. God, for those that you are calling into full-time ministry and missions, God, I pray that you just place on their hearts so heavily that they cannot ignore your call in their life. God, that they will know that you are calling them and, and they will say yes and you will give them the courage to not ignore that. God, for uh, others in this room who just need to take that, that first step, God, I pray that you give them the courage, the time, the ability to go on a short-term mission trip. Remove any doubt or fear that they might have so that they can go see you work around the world. And God, for each one of us, God, we know that even if we can't go, God, that we are senders. God, that we get to be the ones that equip those who go. And so we are just gra grateful to be a part of your ministry around the world, no matter how we can. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Um, I want to, before we go into worship, I want to invite you, if you're led, to maybe come and pray at the altars for one of our mission partners. Maybe you'd like to talk to someone on the sides of the stage, um, one of our prayer partners, about what your next step looks like in this. Um, we're going to enter into a worship song that really is a commitment to Acts 1-8, um, that we speak Jesus. We speak Jesus right here where we are, but we speak Jesus to the ends of the earth as well. Let's stand and worship.